Welcome to Chinwag Tuesdays, your passport to a world of language and culture. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Chinwag Tuesdays. I'm Amanda and today's special guest is Mike from the UK. He's a fellow ESL teacher who's now living in Korea. So thank you so much for being here, Mike. Oh, thank you for having me. Can you just introduce yourself, share a bit about your journey from the UK to Korea? How did teaching English come into the picture? Uh, that's a good question. Yes, my name is Mike and I live in Korea and I teach in a school and I also teach online and I've been doing this for 15 years. No, yeah. <laughs> when I graduated in England, I moved to Spain and I taught English in Spain for a year. And that was very like, interesting and a good lifestyle. And then I decided to, to go on an adventure. So I applied for jobs all around the world. And the first <laughs> job I really like really everywhere. And the first job offer I got was in Korea. So I thought, OK, let's go. Let's go to Korea. And obviously, big panic attack on the way to Korea. <laughs> Don't speak Korean. Like, what the hell have I done? Right? Don't know anybody in Korea. I arrived and yeah, no, since then it's been it's been an adventure. And I must yeah. like it because I'm still here 14 years later. Yeah. Wow, that was my next question. So you've been in Korea 14 years. Yeah, 14 years. Yeah, that's right. Wow. That's incredible. It and what fun. about learning Korean? I know that you're dabbling in learning Korean. What's that look like for you? Okay, so I learned Spanish okay. in school and in university, and then I moved to Madrid. And I think the very first thing I realized is that what I learned in school wasn't really applicable to like <laughs> real life in Spain. <laughs> it's funny, where is the library is not that useful for me when I was living in Madrid. <laughs> this is what we learned yeah. where is the library? And may I borrow a pencil? And yeah, what I really needed to know is, yeah like living Spanish so that yeah. was tough uh, and then like I moved to Korea and I found learning Korean is like another level like it's hard mm -hmm. it's difficult but I tried and then it's been a roller coaster but mm -hmm. now I'm like really invested in learning Korean and I don't know <laughs> this sounds bad but I decided to have lessons like mm. I decided it's time to pay for lessons and I now have like online classes and like uh -huh. I love it. It's so much this sounds like a plug for oh you should <laughs> say online. Paying for classes is great. But it is honestly for me personally yeah. I'm someone that I tried language exchanges and it's okay. Mm -hmm. And I tried self study and it's okay. And I tried Duolingo mm. and it's okay. And obviously for different people, these things work, but like for me personally, yeah. I need that like accountability of having a class and the teachers, have you done your homework? And I'm like, <laughs> and honestly, the pressure of that, I'm like, I have to, because if I sit there and yeah. be like, sorry, teacher, I'm not, I, I can't deal with that pressure. So now I'm like <laughs> really motivated. And yeah. By fear and shame, fear and shame for me are like the major... <laughs> motivators and yeah no like now I have online classes and that's really good for me yeah so, yeah yeah online classes that's right <laughs> that's actually I wouldn't say similar but it is to me with learning Hindi so yeah. I started self-teaching and I am just someone that there is a zero to 100 there is no in the middle for anything okay. that I do it's zero 100 so when I started learning Hindi I was like I'm just going to do this I'm going to just like ace this learning Hindi thing Okay. So I was like trying to use all the different mediums. I was using Duolingo, this website, right. HindiPod 101. I was using a textbook. I was using a kid's book. But then it was like overload because I'd be sitting there going, shit, what do I do first? And like figure out where to start. Duolingo was great for learning the script because just like Korean, you've got the script letters. But then I was using the textbook and that was okay until it wasn't okay because I am someone that asks a lot of questions. Right. And I needed someone to explain to me, why is it like this? Why is it like that? And I'd mm. ask my husband, who's a native English speaker, and he'd say, oh, it's, it's because it is. <laughs> like he was yeah. no help at all. 
And then I decided to go with the language school. So I was doing that for a couple of years, like five times a week. And that's where I learned the foundation. Yeah, Uh it got a lot though. Then I took some time off, but like long story short, uh, even though that was a long story, I'm now (laughs) doing lessons two times a week as well. So I started doing that probably about five or three or four months ago, actually. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I really love it. And same thing when the teacher asks, did you do your homework? I didn't. I didn't, sorry. I can't cope with that. I can't cope with the disappointment. I I have to do it, honestly. It's stressful. But I think that's, I think for me personally, I think I need that accountability. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think when money is involved as well, like you're more like, I have found that for me, like I'm more likely to be committed to things if I'm paying money for it. So it's like anything. A few years ago, I had got like a health coach, like who wrote a training program for me, like a meal plan and stuff like that. And I was like following it to a T because I'm like, I paid money for this. So yeah, it's like most things. But then when I try and self-study, it doesn't really happen too well. (laughs) Yeah, no, I think, yeah, similar experience. And I I don't want to say that I'm cheap. Obviously, no one wants to say that they're cheap, but I am English, but I am British. (laughs) I don't love, definitely, I wouldn't say, I like spending money, but I also, I like to find deals and bargains and Mm -hmm. online apps or whatever, like a free app. I'm like, oh, brilliant, free. But there's always limitations, right? There's always ads and something like, it breaks my flow, breaks my concentration. But yeah, having these classes now, I have a teacher and for one hour, like, we just sit and we talk and it's, it's really helpful for me, definitely. Yeah. So is it like Everyone's conversational good. Korean that you're doing or do you actually do like, do you do textbook stuff too or what kind of classes do you do? Yeah, like I have like specific, I want to be able to, like I can have a conversation now in Korean, like of course, and I, I can order stuff. I can survive in Korean, but yeah. it's at the point now where like, I want like better conversations. I want to have like deeper yeah. conversations about like, mm. you know, anything. And it's, I can listen. I noticed this, right? If native Koreans are having a conversation in Korean, I can follow it. But, and I want to like join in, but it takes me, I like buffering. I'm always like buffering. I'm like two seconds behind the conversation, like to jump <laughs> yeah. in. So like, I jump in and feel like, what are you doing? Like, that was before. Like, where's, yeah. So yeah. that's what I want to reduce that, that buffering mm. speed and be able to jump in with some witty observation or yeah. some cracking put down, but I can. Yeah. Now I'm like, I say something and it's too late. That's the problem. Yeah. Miss the moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In England, do you guys small talk? Because Aussies love a good small talk. Hey, Golan. Good thing. Right. How are you? Indians don't small talk. And I was just talking about this before in the last interview I did, is that here in India, when I found myself in, I wouldn't say uncomfortable situations, but I had to learn to tone down my small talk because people thought it was weird for one and people got the wrong idea. So I had to be really careful with that. Mm. What about the small talk situation between the UK and Korea? That's a really good point. I may listen to like, when there's like that awkward silence, when you're just oh, I like, hate awkward silences. And this is really uncomfortable. And to be honest, I think that in England, I'm not great at small talk, right? But in Korea, yeah. for example, I'll be in the lift with someone that I know, or not mm. know, but someone that I've met before, mm. and be in the lift, and it'd be like, I'm just, when you're like watching the, <laughs> the numbers, and you're like, why is yeah. this lift so slow? And so then I'm like, let's fill in the gaps with some small talk. But yeah, I don't know. That's something I really want to improve because yeah, Korean small talk, but it, I don't know. It's, it's just different, right? It's a different yeah. kind of thing. There's a lot of things like, where are you going? They'll often say, if they know you a little bit and they see you in the lift, they'll be like, where? oh, where are you going? And in England, that would be That's a, a bit invasive. Yeah. yeah. You know, like in England, Why, like, oh, Why do you want to know? I know, right? One time I was in the lift and I had two full big bags of rubbish because we live in apartments, right? And there's communal bins. So I had these two huge bags full of rubbish and uh, like recycling, right? And this person is, oh, Mike, 
where, where are you going? And I'm like, I'm going to the bins because this is all right. <laughs> and it was, I don't know, it just didn't have that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not. I, yeah, so that's something I want to improve. Yeah. Having better small talk, definitely, because it's, yeah. it's awkward. Did you find it hard to make friends in Korea um, because of the language differences and everything? So, uh, yeah, no, the la- not because of my personality, because of the like language <laughs> Yeah. 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 <laughs> some from column A, some from column B. No. Um, <laughs> A little bit of both. <laughs> yeah. No, to be honest, not really, because mm. I find, I think... So I play football and I always have done and it's such a good way to meet people because you have that immediate common ground, right? And yeah. Koreans love football almost as much as English do yeah. and they're interested in, like, in that. So there's always that common ground. And also, mm-hmm. to be honest, like Korean people, from my experience, quite drinking. So we also have that common ground of, oh, so what do you like? to drink or what do you like to eat koreans are really mm. interested in food and drink and soccer and yeah so am i so we've always had that <laughs> common ground <laughs> yeah pretty much right so no i think in that regard not so much it's yeah. okay what about That's good. in india is it difficult to lie <gasps> i found it a bit hard in the first couple of months but i also wasn't going anywhere to be able to meet people but i, I had a panic attack after three months of living there i remember my husband and i were coming home from the gym and I just, we had to pull over the car because I was having a panic attack in the car. And then it was a mixture of not being able to understand the language, not having any friends and just like, it just, everything was different. Piles up. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's like, Amanda, it's been two months. These things take time. And yeah. I'm like, you know, in my mind, I was like two months too long. Um, yeah. And I, I can laugh about it now because really it was just two months, but I feel like it was just, yeah, it was really hard. And six months before I moved, I actually came to India for a holiday. Uh-huh. And when I left, I decided to, on Instagram, this sounds kind of creepy, but I decided to look at like the geotag of my city and follow girls in my city that had similar interests because I thought maybe they can be a potential friend. I was like, I'm going to nail this making friends thing as well when I move. <laughs> and so I did. That's actually how I met my best friend. So. Okay. I started following her and we had the same interests, but I didn't contact her when I first moved because I thought that was a bit weird. But anyway, in the end, yes, we became friends. But besides that, I did find it a little bit hard because I was a really shy kid growing up. I would say now I'm a bit of an introverted extrovert, so I can be Mm. introverted. I'm very extroverted on the internet. I can jump on like stories (laughs) and talk for days, but in person, I'm still a bit shy. And there was that kind of fear of, there being a language barrier if I did try to meet someone and they didn't understand me and then I'm left there awkwardly what now yeah so definitely. yeah it did take me a while but yeah I'm, it took me a couple of years actually, besides my best friend but mm. even now at the gym I a girl just the other day came up and asked me like people are getting really curious where are you from what's your name what are you doing yeah. here and I can uh-huh. I'm really good at saying that in Hindi So I speak a mix of Hindi and English, but yeah, it was a bit hard for me at the beginning to make friends, but I also wasn't putting myself out there. And nine months after I moved, the pandemic started. Yeah, yeah, that that really, I think for everybody that had such, obviously for everyone, it was really traumatic and really like difficult. And in Korea, for example, I don't think it was that like, like, we didn't have a full lockdown. And Korea, I think, managed the situation quite well compared to what happened in England. <laughs> yeah. But still, it was like a really, obviously for everybody, a weird time. Mm. And like now, the yeah, yeah it's just difficult to socialise and be normal, right? Yeah. That's how teaching started for me was through the pandemic. I just needed some like social interactions. I needed something. And then I yeah. started teaching on the platform Cambly and just, mm-hmm. just for the social interaction. And then it developed into the English with Amanda and wow. Graham. But yeah. Yeah, at the beginning, it was just a bit of a hobby because I was like, I need to talk. Because yeah. India had very strict lockdowns to the point, like you wouldn't believe it. The first three, two or three months of lockdown, when it, you were only allowed to leave for essential services, that didn't include alcohol. The alcohol store, the liquor store, he was shut. 
my husband, he his business is liquor stores. He sells alcohol. So, like, he wasn't working. I wasn't working. It was really tough at the beginning. And, yeah. yeah, it was just, it's, looking back now, it was just crazy. It was so strict. I, we had a, well, we've got three dogs now. But at the yeah. time, we had the one. And we weren't even allowed to walk him outside because we weren't allowed outdoors. So wow. I used to have to sneak up to the rooftop of our building because apartments in India have a flat roof because we okay. don't get snow in my city. So the right. roofs are really flat and people use them as socializing areas. So I would sneak up to the rooftop just to run with my dog. So the first year, India handled it really well. But then afterwards, people got a little bit complacent. And right. everyone thought, yeah, India, like, smash this. Like, we're, like, kill, you know, we're, I wouldn't say killing COVID, but, like, we're really, yeah. like, beating COVID. The second wave came, and that's when it was, like, so bad it made international media, how bad it was here. And then, mm-hmm. yeah, it was just chaos. Yeah, I mean, it was a really tough time, I think, for everyone. Mm-hmm. Like, so I feel a bit lucky. Like, I'm mean, in Korea, like, it was, mm-hmm. was okay, I think. Yeah, but it was still, like, obviously tough time do you teach kids or adults what age group do you teach at the school actually online and at the school at the moment teaching online adults yeah and then kids so i have a school so the kids come here like an after school school so the kids come here and they learn here it's mainly elementary school at the moment yeah yeah but it's good it's a good mix i like because of the timings like the kids go to school in the morning And then they come here to my school after two o'clock. So in the mornings, I do like adult classes. And it's a good good mix. Like, it's a good mix because the adult classes, it's quite cerebral. You've got to use your brain. You've got to be like, especially using the, like using Zoom or whatever, Mm -hmm. like using the online classes. I think you've got to be quite creative to teach things. Like, firstly, to be interesting, to teach things in an interesting way and to get your point across without a whiteboard, without any physical gestures. You can see my head and my hands, but that's it, right? Well, sometimes to get your point across, right? But with kids, it's a different challenge because there it's just physical, really physical, and also trying to keep them, like, on topic. <laughs> keep them, yeah, like, right. Keep them, like, entertained but focused on the lesson, so... Like, it's challenging, but it's good. It's good. I think it's good for me to have that mix. How about you? Mostly just adults, to be honest. I do have some kids from Hong Kong. Actually, I think the other, I think it's just one now because the rest of their package finished. I I would prefer not to teach kids, to be Uh honest. I don't really, I don't feel like I have a lot of patience for that. So I don't (laughs) do complete beginners. I don't teach complete beginners. It's mostly just like adult intermediate up. Um, yeah, I just don't have patience to teach kids. <laughs> it's definitely, it's yeah. I think now, like when I was younger, in a way, it was harder because I think mm. I didn't have the, the skills to, yeah. to make a classroom of kids. I think that's what it comes down to for me as well. I don't have the, that experience or those skills. I probably could learn it, but my main kind of topic is Australian English. And I don't really, there's not a really demand for kids to learn that. No, yeah, I, I don't know. But I think like here in Korea, there's there's a lot of demand for British English. So yeah, all my like branding is like Mike English and like using the the Big Ben and that. Yeah. Like, my like logo colors are all like like blue, red and white. Yeah. Like, it's deliberately like British English, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 But yeah, I don't know. I did, like I try, I really try to keep, teach the kids British English. So it's all yeah. like water. It's guys, it's water. May I have yeah. some water? And and they'll honestly they'll follow that really well until they're about fourth grade. So that means they're about ten or eleven, and then mm. they'll be like water. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, you, we talked about, it. and I'll be like water, and they'll be like water. And it was just to wind me up, just to tease me. It's constant. Yeah. It's a back and forth, but we've learned this, and they'll yeah. be like, "Oh, no, you're right, yeah, water." I, uh, stressful, but I'm happy they get an opportunity to know how English should be taught, should be spoken. <laughs> water, oh, and look, and, yeah. darker. Oh, it's right. so funny. A couple of my reels have gone viral now. The really funny uh-huh. ones, and the comment section is just like a like a pit, basically. 
and like the pe- the comments people say is there's always fighting about like American English, British English, Australian right. English, all this kind of stuff. It's so crazy, which is that's appearing in English. Why are you calling it Australian English? Yeah. No, I don't know. Comment section. <sighs> comment sections on Instagram. I find Instagram not so bad because generally the people on there are like, it's that they're represented by their own name usually. So yeah. I find Instagram comments are generally quite nice. Sometimes yeah. really nice. Like when things go viral, you do get stuff like... That's, like that's the been the problem for me, yeah. Yeah, no one speaks like that. And I'd be like... I do. Yeah, no one, yeah. no one yeah. speaks like one person does at least. Always yeah. like, but yeah. YouTube is. Oh, I always thought YouTube was the cesspit. How's your experience of YouTube comments? It depends. Oh, look, actually, I've had my fair share of trolls, and I sometimes it does affect me a little bit. But on Aussie English, it's really the problem is when my videos go viral, they some they somehow end up getting onto Australian for you page or their pages. Yeah. But then that's the problem is that Australians come in and they're like, get really defensive about everything. Yes. So I had is a reel is... with Hannah go viral on YouTube. Uh-huh. It was the one where she's she's my waitress and oh. she's asking what I want. And I'm like, I want a veggie burger. And she's like, what? Do you mean uh, burger? Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. And I had so many Aussies in there. We don't even say veggie. And I'm like, I'm Aussie. We, we don't even sound like that. I hate when people like make fun of the Australian accent. I'm like, bro, I am Australian and I do yeah. speak like this. Like I'm yeah, not faking yeah. this. And I say veggie. Then I went home to my hometown and there was a bloody veggie burger on the menu. So obviously <laughs> I grew up with veggie because that's the original right. thing. Yeah. And I'm just like, just because you haven't heard a word or a phrase before doesn't mean that no one says it. It's just maybe a different region or a different area that says it. How did you adapt to Korean culture? So you've been in Korea like 14 years. So right. how have you adapted? Did you find it like, obviously it's very different to say British culture. So what aspects did you find a bit difficult or surprising? That's a good question. So I think for me, there there are like little things, like little behavioral things, for example, taking Mm -hmm. your shoes off in like a restaurant. When you go into someone's house or anything, actually, I did that in England anyway. So that wasn't like a big thing. Take it some restaurants, you take your shoes off before you go in the restaurant. And so those things are not that difficult to adapt to, I think. I think perhaps the working culture here is a bit more hierarchical it's a bit more as an employee you're expected to defer to your boss more more than you would in England whereas in England if your boss told you to do something and it was unreasonable you could be like that's not really like you could have a conversation about right like where yeah here it's a bit more like if your boss tells you to do something you should just do it so yeah that and I'm quite like easygoing so generally mm. I can adapt to that and be like okay but I think there are other times where you know like there were I was given jobs where I felt mm-hmm. like I I still do it because here you just do it right you, you get given a <laughs> yeah you get given a task and you just go yeah okay yeah good one boss but mm. uh, on the inside, I'm thinking, what is the... Mm, yeah. So I used to teach at a at a public school, right? And, yeah. um, and I was the... What they have, they have this thing where, you know, I'm there as a native English teacher. So I'm mm-hmm. supposed to give the students an opportunity to hear, like, native English and to, mm. to have, like, cultural kind of experiences things like christmas and halloween and, and these kind of things so that's fine yeah. that's all and then one of my responsibilities was like a five to ten minute mini lesson before teachers okay. meeting so we have an, okay. a teachers meeting every week on a monday and like my sort of i feel like i was like the warm-up act right so they would come in and i hate this obviously i hated this and then every week I had to prepare like a dialogue, right? So we'd go and I'd be like, right, guys, today we're going to learn how to like speak English in a shop, for example. 
But I do enjoy doing that because there's 50, 50 teachers, all of like different English levels. And the one that have really good English, this is mm. basic, this is boring. And the ones yeah. that don't have much English, you're like, we don't understand them. This is also boring. Yeah. And it was suggested to me, and now I say suggested, it was like <laughs> firmly suggested that we switch, yeah. switch to songs. Right, I'm not. I'm not. I'm British, right? I'm British, and I don't. You know, I'm not really. I've not got much of a singing voice, and I definitely don't have this character to be like. Come on, guys, let's sing. Yeah. Uh, And I just remember the song, and I. It was again. It was suggested to me. Why don't you ask the teachers what songs they want to to sing? This is gonna. So obviously, it was just like. Simon and Garfunkel, Bridge Over Troubled Waters, right? And that's quite high. There are quite high parts to that. Like that, just honestly. But I felt I couldn't say no to that because here you can't really say no when your boss, the principal, gives you a no. Yeah, that's tough. But over time, like now I run my own business, so Mm -hmm. it's different because now, like, my bosses are, are my customers. So... In a way, there's more give and take, but I think also yeah. like financially motivated to to agree to people's requests more because I get paid. Yeah, more. Like, yeah. But no singing. I say there's no. Singing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Think, like, That's where you no draw amount, the line. That's the boundary. There is no amount of money that would encourage yeah. me to like sing. Yeah. <laughs> no. What about you? Like in in India, it must be very different to like. Yeah, yeah. There were a few. Oh, I don't even know if I could say there were a few big things at the beginning, but I felt like it was an accumulation of things over time that really that did get to me. Obviously, the language was really tough. Probably the language was the biggest barrier or the biggest culture shock because when I moved here, I wasn't working. I came from a very social company. When I was in Australia, I became really good friends with a lot of my colleagues. So for me, going to work was like a social affair. So uh-huh. to go from being very social every day and coming here and not working and socializing with really just my husband and not having yeah. routine, not having any structure to my day, it was really lonely and isolated. So yeah. I think that's what contributed to the panic attack I had after two months because I was just really lonely until we got a dog. <laughs> that's why we got our first <laughs> dog. Like you say, it's hard when you don't have that. If you're, yeah, it's. I think it's. I think it's just like a difficult experience, right? Moving somewhere and not having something to make you like meet people and talk, even yeah. with, with barrier. There are some things that you can communicate with, right? I've always worked in Korea. I've always worked, so every day you go to work and you meet people, even if there is like a different like mindset maybe or a different mm-hmm. like language barrier yeah you have something in common always like you have yeah the students in common or you have the, the you know, there's always something to like mm. but yeah definitely in in the first in the beginning when I moved here there weren't like lonely but times like it's mm. you're moved somewhere and you miss your family and that and friends and that it's, yeah yeah yeah, and I don't think, and I've talked about this on a couple of other um, interviews that will be coming out, <clears throat> but I think one thing that isn't really talked about enough is the feeling of kind of not really ever feeling in one place. So, like, I when I went back to Australia for the first time, I got there and I felt like I was too Indian for Australia because I picked up right. these Indian kind of mannerisms and behaviours. Right. But then here in India, sometimes I feel like I'm too Australian. And I mm-hmm. never really felt like I belonged to either country. And right. I think that's something that a lot of people who move abroad feel, and I don't think it's really talked about enough because I definitely was not expecting that feeling to go back uh-huh. to my home country and then all of a sudden kind of feel out of place. Yeah, I guess you end up in the middle because yeah. obviously I'm never going to be Korean. <laughs> like, yeah. right? it, it doesn't matter how good my Korean is or like mm. how culturally sensitive I am how aware I am of Korea there's obviously something that I'm, I'm not gonna be <laughs> that Korean yeah and, um yeah but at the same time yeah going to England I haven't lived in England for 
15 years. So I don't mm. really, I don't really know what it's like to be like really English anymore. When was the Being, last time you went home? When was the last time? Bef- before coronavirus, I think. No, is it? Yeah, I think it is. Before coronavirus. So wow. that four years? Yeah. Quite a long time. It's quite a long time. <laughs> I'll be right. That come no, did I go last year? No, I don't think so. I think it is, yeah, four four years. No, wow. is that true? Do you know I <laughs> honestly I'm such an old man. Like I honestly I have no idea. <laughs> Maybe four years, yeah. Yeah. And you? Sorry, when did you I guess it, oh I went last year actually. So I didn't go back for three and a half years. So I moved to India and then pandemic happened and I went back. It was Christmas, like about a year ago, a bit more than a year ago, I went back for five weeks. Had a meltdown by like day five because everything was different and I don't like change. Then I went back in September for my brother's wedding. So there was just a nine month gap in between. And the second time around, it was fine because I'd I'd experienced all of those reverse culture shocks that I knew what I was walking into. I knew what to expect. Even when I was going to the airport the first time, I felt like a deer in the headlights. I just didn't know, I feel like I didn't know how to travel anymore. Okay. Vegetarian, I am vegetarian, but going, no, I'm pescatarian actually, I should be honest. I don't have seafood that often. Pescatarian is someone who eats seafood. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't eat it that often. That's why I say I'm a vegetarian because I have it maybe once every few months. But going, transiting through Singapore airport, didn't even know what I could eat because everything is so meat focused there. Yeah. And I ended up getting Burger King because they had like a, a vegan burger or something. Okay. Yeah, I'd even just walking through the airport, I was like feeling really out of place. Yeah. So it was quite hard. But the second time around, I was like, felt like I was a seasoned traveler. It was fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Going back to the, because of coronavirus. So I live in a really small city. And yeah, I also didn't travel by airplane for three years so then yeah uh, last year I went to a friend's wedding in in Taiwan traveling by plane the airport and then getting to Taiwan Taipei and obviously it's a big it's a proper city and I was also just a bit shocked just yeah of walking around and you getting get so older used to being in your little comfort zone and then getting older as well the last time I traveled four years ago everything was fine and then this time when I traveled I was like I can't see anymore. I need. I didn't realize, but I'm around the airport, and I'm like, I can't read any of the signs. Just stand like yeah. this close next to the signs to read them because in four years I have turned blind. It turns out, but definitely, yeah, it was weird to travel by plane again, and uh, it was great. It was yeah. brilliant, but it was weird. You yeah, know? yeah. So before when you said that you don't know what it feels like to be British anymore, it leads into my next question about if you find ways to maintain your kind of a piece of your identity, that British part of yourself, do you have any ways that you try and stay connected to your home country and where you're from? Because obviously being in in a different culture, it's easy to become consumed by that. Uh, Yeah, no, that's a really interesting question. I think I just think like for me personally, I quite like Korean culture. So there are a lot of things that mm-hmm. I, I can adapt to, but there are some things yeah. where I'm like really stuck, <laughs> stuck in my life, <laughs> stuck in the mud. Like breakfast is the one like where I just can't eat Korean food for breakfast. Like I can't do it. They have breakfast. like rice and fish and like proper like dinner meal for breakfast, don't they? What right, I would right. consider a dinner meal. Yeah. No. <laughs> Absolutely. And like meat and spicy things. Yeah. And I just can't, like, I just can't. Yeah. I just, so that's still, I have an English style breakfast. Yeah. And I think I'm a bit of a baby like that. I'm not flexible really to yeah. have a Korean breakfast because it just doesn't suit Preference. me. Yeah. yeah. And, and then football as well. I'm still, I play football a lot and I think I play football in a very English style. So I think that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think people, that know me think that I'm quite like I am like I'm very like calm and, and friendly mm. and yeah Korean people think that English are gentlemen and um, yeah. I quite like that like stereotype so I'd be like yeah no I'm quite gentleman but <laughs> but then when people like see me play like football they are see you a player? <laughs> 
they see the real British hooligan. It's like, <laughs> it's bad. Something switches in me. I'm actually watching football as well. It just mm. gets emotional. And it's something, yeah. it's just something innate in me, I think. It just changed. Yeah. But like, apart from that, I don't know. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? But apart from that, anything else? No, I don't even drink tea anymore. I, yeah. It's sad. Drink tea anymore. I just, yeah, this kind yeah. of thing. What about you? Give me, what do you do? Love. It's one of the reasons why I started Aussie English with Amanda, actually. I find that kind of helps keep me connected to the Australian culture side of things because I'm now more than ever before, I'm following up with like Australian news. I'm keeping up to date with Australian series and movies. Uh-huh, and yeah. It helps keep me connected to Australia. My mum's Italian, so. She was born in Australia, but her parents immigrated from Italy. And so I grew up eating Italian food. So when I feel homesick, I cook Italian food because that's what I grew up with, right? Yeah. Also, I was never really a, a very religious person in Australia. I was, like I'd say I'm Catholic, but I wasn't like an avid church goer. I just go occasionally. Here, I wouldn't say I'm an avid church goer either, but I'm definitely more religious. Like I'll go to church on Christmas and Easter. Because mm. I feel like that helps mm. keep me connected to Australia in a way. Because mm. the church is a church. Yeah. Anywhere you go, really. So I can do I... that connection to where I'm from. Because India is a really, I would say it's a bit overpowering in some ways. It's a very strong culture. And it's really easy to become consumed in that and forget about where you're from and forget about who you are as a person. And I've mm. seen that happened to people before, like other foreigners either married to an Indian or living in India, that they forget about where they've come from. Yeah. So I actively found ways to stay connected to my, my cultural background. Yeah. So definitely like cooking lasagna would be one, going to church on Christmas and Easter and celebrating those and teaching others about Australian English. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, I didn't really think about that, but that's a good point. That definitely, I find the teaching about English culture is, I don't know. I don't know about you, but for me, the content making process is the hard thing is like brainstorming, right? Like I'm there and yeah. I'm thinking like, because you want to do something that's like interesting, but you also want to do something that's useful and you yeah. definitely want to do something that's like genuine. Yeah. Do you know what? So I make the brainstorming thing. and But when I'm doing making the content, it reminds me of all of the weird like British culture things that I forgot about. You know? Yeah. And it's nice. That's where like, I, exactly. Mm. Yeah, that's exactly why I do it. Is like feeling that connection. And I actually have so many Australians follow me now. And like, it's really nice to get Aussies in the comments that are like giving me suggestions or say things like, oh, yeah, like we say this. Or there's one guy that comments quite a lot, which is really nice. He, I actually don't know if he lives in Australia or maybe he, I think he might live in London now. His wife's British. Mm. And he like says that he loves my stuff because it like reminds me of like Australian culture. It's very funny. Right. So it's nice getting those kind of comments and I'm helping remind people as well about definitely. Australian culture. Yeah, no, definitely. The bits, yeah, it's nice. When you get those comments and people are like, oh, this is interesting, or I didn't know that. Like yeah. sharing about English culture. No, it's good, isn't it? It's, it makes you feel like you're doing something good. Just yeah, exactly. Helping people, even because Instagram, it's like, 30 seconds short thing right but if if you can teach yeah. one thing or if you can just let people know about one thing I think that's quite mm-hmm. heartwarming for me quite satisfying for me yeah yeah I agree all right I'm going to just jump straight ahead to the last question assumptions about Australia or Australians and I'll tell you whether you are right or wrong okay so <laughs> in England growing up we were exposed to three sources of Australian culture right and I think you might be able to guess three, and this is going to age me, right? But the first one was Neighbours. The second yep. one was Home and Away. And, yep. and the third is Crocodile Dundee, right? Yes, like, I knew it. That, yep. <laughs> that is pretty much it, right? I don't know. I always thought and still honestly still believe that Australia is quite dangerous for wild animals. And this makes me nervous, like spiders and snakes mm-hmm. and this sort of thing. So is that a thing? Is that a case? Yes. And Hannah had this same assumption, actually. Okay. Yeah. And you've probably seen my stories of the, the snake that's hanging out in my dad's garden. I don't. Did you see that story? Yeah. yeah. I, look, my dad lives in a regional area that's close to the beach. So, And there's a lot okay. of bushland around. So it's more common to see we've got 
a snake that hangs out. He's got like a lizard. There's a lot of birds, things like that. Spiders you'll find everywhere, actually, cities or countryside. Yes, there is that assumption. I also used to live in the Northern Territory, which is famous for crocodiles. So, yeah, there's crocodiles in the water. I lived in Darwin at the top part of Australia, and there was a little, there was a beach in the, the suburb I lived in. And they told you not to go swimming in there, but I'm a beach baby. I grew up on the beach and I couldn't resist. So I would lay on the beach and then I would run in and run out really quickly just to get wet. Yeah. And then that night of the news, there was a crocodile spotting at that same beach and I never went back. That's the beginning of this of this interview. You asked me like how I ended up in Korea, right? And yeah. I told you that I applied for jobs around the world. And that's not exactly true. Like before I applied for jobs around it, I did check on are there dangerous animals in that country, right? So, like, <laughs> so, so Korea, Japan, like China, like even, you know, these sort I was like pretty, pretty safe country. So anywhere where there wasn't deadly animals, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. So that yeah. worries me. What else? Yeah. So that is a um, true assumption, yeah. Yeah. No, and then neighbours and home and away. They're still they, running, by the way. They're still on. They're still going strong. Even neighbours, apparently, I don't know, there was some thing where England didn't want to pay for it. The, the TV channel in, in the UK didn't want to mm. pay for it anymore. But it's still going. It is. So they actually had this big finale. They said that they were, like, finishing. They were stopping. That's it. They yeah, brought yeah. back all these old stars, like Kylie Minogue came. Everyone came. And now it's back on again. Do, do you watch it? Is that something? I don't anymore. I never watched Neighbours growing up. My family were home and away watchers. And we watched that religiously until I was in high school. Then mum and dad got over it. And then uh. we stopped watching. And I don't watch that anymore. But sometimes I look for clips online, like for my lessons. Like, but yeah, some really famous Aussies came from home and away. Chris Hemsworth, Thor. He was mm. in home and away. Margot Robbie, Barbie. A couple of others too that dabbled in Hollywood. Yeah. Do you know, like in Neighbours, there's the doctor, Dr. Carl. Carl, yeah. So Alan something, right? Anyway, the actor. uh, Like when I was at university, uh, and this was after the peak of Neighbours, but he, my university student union, had he was coming and he played like a gig. Like (laughs) where he played like the guitar, a leather jacket on. And it was like, and it was a big thing. And the crowds there, people were like, ah, Dr. Carl, my name's Alan. <laughs> Shut up, Dr. Carl. You know, and like, it was, I don't know. I think he must have made good money from it. Right? But yeah. Oh, it's so funny. I think in England and Australia, we have a lot in common, right? Yeah. Like, I think we sort of, there's the rivalry for cricket, I think, but I don't like yeah. cricket. So that doesn't affect me. But apart yeah. from that, we are cousins, right? Yeah, exactly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I technically am a quarter British. The thing about British like to joke that Australians mm. are like, for the history of Australia, like like criminals, right? That's a joke. Yes. Obviously, yes. that's not true. But it, I think we have good banter. I think like yes, British and Australians, true. we have a bit of that banter. So like, Austra- I don't know, mm-hmm. what's the Australian like opinion of Brits? I'm curious. I think that there's something I think definitely the food I think the food's very bland there's the impression that British food is really boring and bland and that you love the pub (laughs) that's all accurate that's all accurate good very good yeah honestly I think British food is pretty rubbish as well to be honest bland (laughs) bland is a nice way to say there is good food but it's all the the good food the best food we have is imported from other countries right it's it's yeah like curry like in Birmingham curry is just incredible like it's (laughs) Fantastic. Yeah, so okay, I think I've got a question that... for you. Because you had said that we're basically cousins. How do you say the letter that is at the start of the name Harry? Oh, okay. How do you so, pronounce this? So there are two letter. answers here, right? Yeah. I would pronounce that right. Okay. Oh, that's not gone down well. <laughs> so you don't. <laughs> well, I'm wrong that. though. I'm wrong. I'm on the hate bandwagon, but I'm wrong. Right. Technically, yeah. So it should be H? Technically, yes. Phonetically speaking, it should be H with the silent H, but I actually say H. So I think it depends on where you grew up, what you were taught, different regions. And I did a poll on Instagram, and I think it was like almost 50-50. But I did a reel explaining why H is pronounced H in Australia. And the comments were really interesting because there were Australians in there, and they were half 
Some people saying they say H, others saying they say H. But yeah, I think it comes down to that criminal history. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. Or it's just English being uptight. So I think like the reputation that we have around the world mm -hmm. is that maybe a little bit uptight about, about this. <laughs> so, yeah, that's true. The stiff upper lip, yes. Stiff upper so, lip, yeah. Yeah. As so. I said before, my granddad's from England. So yeah. him and my grand met during World War II. Gran, mm -hmm. she's like from a long line of Australians. Eventually there was some kind of, oh my Criminal. gosh, what's the word? Immigration. <laughs> uh, well, Immigrating that's, that's, happened. That's a terrible thing to say about your grandma. I apologise. It's was fine. Really, really poor man. That's not very gentlemanly. I take that back, right? But, <laughs> so there was some kind of immigration that happened in, from her side of the family. But granddad from England, they met during World War II. Granddad was in the British Navy helping protect Sydney Harbour from the um, right. Japanese right. invasion. So they met. After World War II finished, Gran jumped on a ship known as a bride ship and travelled to England to get married. Okay. okay. They decided they didn't want to stay in England, came back to Australia. So I think my dad uses a lot of language and slang that is British focused because okay. his dad's straight from England. Yeah. So I grew up, I think, hearing that side of things and that side of the accent, but I still don't know where I get H from. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't. Honestly, I don't think this is like, like it makes sense, doesn't it? It makes sense for it to be H, like it does. Like, that does <laughs> yeah. Sense. I just remember my grandma telling us we do, we don't say we don't say H, we say H. Yeah. yeah. I feel like, I, I feel like my grand and granddad would say H though, because my grand is like the kind of woman who would like scold us for having our elbows on the table because it's not like proper etiquette, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know, I think so, we might I don't have know. easy cousins because my gran also <laughs> the same thing. Get your elbows off the table. Yeah, it's comfortable, but children yeah, no. should be should be seen but not heard. Oh yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's funny. Definitely, Some similarities yeah. then. All right, we'll, we'll start to finish up. But before we finish up, if anyone wants to contact you for English, how can they contact? Uh, yeah, just on Instagram. Send me a message and, and we can talk about it, right? I think that's it, really. Yeah. Everything will be in the description anyway, so you can that's send me fine. it later. <laughs> thank you. Cool. All right. Thank you so much for featuring. Thank you. What a pleasure. It's really fun. Yeah, really yeah. fun. It was great. <clears throat>